volume on. First John chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 6. I'll read a couple of verses to get us back into context of where we're at. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of, at least on the first couple of verses, uh, a couple of maybe a conversation about uh, some misunderstanding and application today uh, on the New Testament in general. But let me read uh, the first five verses to get us back into context. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Let me pause for a second before we pick up. So we pointed out in verse 2 and 3, he's actually making a, a very clear distinction between those in the congregation that believe that Jesus actually came in human form, had a spiritual body, uh, lived, as a, lived as a sinless man, and died. And the ones who did not believe that, that was causing trouble in the congregation, were the docetists. And so in that blanket statement there, when he, he talks about um, everyone that confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, he's not saying simply, if, it, it, as long as somebody says he came in the flesh, they're all right with God. That's not what he's saying. He is clearly pointing out in context the difference between the docetists or those Gnostics uh, who did not believe that Jesus had a spiritual body, I mean, had a human body, that he had a spiritual body. So that's what he's talking about there. Now, you'd have people that would generalize that type of a comment, and it would lead into a, an understanding of what most people probably believe today as far as Christendom. And what I mean is, is most people today have the understanding, well, it doesn't really matter what anyone believes as long as they have basic fundamentals, uh, and they believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Uh, and you even have those within the church, or that used to be within the church, who have taken that uh, approach. Does anybody remember probably one of the very first promoters of that? I think we've mentioned his name a number of times. Rubel Shelley. Uh, I, have the, I used to have the book downstairs. I, I don't know if I do or not. I still may. Uh, if I remember correctly, he wrote a book called the, uh, was it called the Bullseye Gospel? Basically, if you read it, what he's saying is, is here's all the key fundamentals, and as long as everyone agrees on those, none of the other stuff matters, okay? And that's pretty much what he was teaching. Uh, and at that point, once you accept that, you go into full fellowship with anybody, okay? Now, we're going to pick up here in verse 6. He says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, let's make a, a distinction here. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. All right. Then he makes the distinction. He that is not of God heareth not us. We're going to focus in on this word here. We and us. Okay. The we here does not include all of the saints. It can't, because if it did, then who were, who were those that heard us? Notice the distinction. We are of God, so he's pointing out a class of people. He that knoweth God heareth us. Who's the us? Specifically. Speaker. The speaker, and in context, who's writing this? John, right, who is a apostle. The people of, he says, we are of God. Now, they were literally uh, the disciples of Christ, and they were appointed, and I'll try to kind of generally point this out, they were appointed as his disciples to do what? Go and, go and preach the gospel, and in such doing, we have them teaching, the, uh, teaching inspired truth and recording inspired truth, okay? We are of God, and he that knoweth God heareth us. All right, so they accept their doctrine, they hear their doctrine. Then he makes the distinction. 
He that is not of God heareth not us. Who within the congregation was hearing the apostles or listening to the apostles? If we're going to keep kind of in context what's going on. You've got the faithful, and those would be the ones that are falling in alignment with what John is even writing here by inspiration. But then you have those who disagree with this apostle. Those would be the docetists, right? One group's of God, one group is not of God. And he's pointing this back to the inspired word. So, John, yep. This is one way for the listener, right, of this letter to know who is what, right? Yep. So the one that listens to us is of God. The one that isn't listening to us is not of God. And that's how somebody in the audience of, of, that's reading this mm -hmm. can discern between who to follow. And if you think, I mean, he's already made very clear in his writings that Jesus did come in the flesh. Now, he's not done dealing with that, but he's pointed out a number of things. Now, if, if this was read, which was the common practice, uh, to the congregation, and if the congregation was full of those that held the one side and those that held the other, the docetists and the, the faithful Christians, some were going to accept what he said and some were not. And as Jerry said, this right here is the dividing line. Those that, in, that, those that are going to accept this inspired truth that you are receiving, those are the ones that know with God. Because they're going to listen to what I'm saying as an apostle. It's inspired. But those who will not, they don't, they don't know God. Okay? And then he makes the statement there, Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The we here refers specifically to the apostles, but in a secondary sense, it would also include those that taught the same truth as the apostles. The apostles were of God. We know that because they were, in the, they were in alignment with the will of God, and they taught truth. Now, you've got other Christians who were taught by the apostles, and they therefore went, and they are out doing exactly really what was taught in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, where the apostles were to go out and to teach, to convert, baptize, and then they were to go out and teach. So the cycle continues, right? The ones who are of God are the ones that are speaking truth and the ones that will listen to truth being spoken to. So really, in a secondary sense, those that taught the same truth as the apostles also are of God or those that believe the truth. The main premise is that those who truly know God are in unity of teaching with all others who truly know God. That's, that's very common sense when you begin to talk about congregations that teach the same thing. They're in fellowship one with another. They are all of God. They all know God. They all are in unity with the teaching of God and the teaching happening within multiple congregations, right? Yep. Something to add to this, I mean, for us, how this applies to us, I think, is, you know, the same question that Paul has right? Who is the one that's No, and that would carry... They yeah. They, these, these, these men here probably said the same thing. Yeah, they're of God, but they didn't do what God did. I mean, you have numbers of congregations. Go ahead. Oh, well, that's just a, another action word that, is, that we actually have to take part in doing. It's not just something that comes upon us. It's an action we have to take. We hear it's God's commands, right? We yeah. I mean, there's a lot of congregations out there that will say, well, we're Christians. And then you'll say, well, what do you believe about, let's say, a very, let's, I'll just pick probably the, probably the worst topic I could pick. But let's say, well, what do you guys you know, teach as far as, um, do you guys stand against abortion? And they would say, well, you know, if they were Joel Osteen, they'd say, well, we don't get involved in things like that. That's a pretty doctrinal statement. I don't think anywhere you're going to find uh, murdering babies is condoned. Uh, you, maybe you could talk about any, any other doctrine out there, whether it's how to be saved, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Anything that somebody would oppose, which is an inspired teaching, clearly shows that they are not of God. Those that are of God adhere to the teaching. But if you break this down in a nutshell, the simplest way to look at it is the apostles taught and we teach. When we teach what the apostles taught, we're in fellowship with the apostles. They were in fellowship with the will of God because they were sent out to teach according to the will of God. They were teaching by inspiration. So when we teach what the apostles taught or when we obey and we're faithful to what the apostles taught, 
and, and multiple congregations do that. We're all in fellowship one with another. It's a very simple concept to get. I think many congregations have gotten away from that. I probably shouldn't even bring this up, but since we touched on it last week, uh, and that's kind of why I wrote the article, it gets kind of scary when you begin to talk about, let's say, um, where the thought popped in my mind, where was I going with it? I was going to start talking about works of the church for a second. Uh, oh, unity. <clears throat> so you, you begin to talk about unity, and I touched on this a little bit. Every work of the church that we read about within the scriptures uh, is not larger than a local congregation, except in the examples where you had multiple congregations, for example, um, who were, let's say, sending money to the poor, right? Something like that, where each congregation was giving. But you don't find the example where congregations would give money to, let's say, a board of directors or a group and then let them go do whatever they want. I actually had this conversation with somebody at work today. We were talking about how the church uh, provides for needy and so forth. And I was explaining to him that we never give money. And I explained why. And he goes, well, that makes perfect sense. I wouldn't give them money either. I said, because how do you know what they're going to do with it? Are they going to go to, a, to an establishment they shouldn't be in? Or are they going to use it on, for drugs or whatever? And he's like, that makes perfect sense. I wouldn't give. If they needed clothes, he said, you'd go buy them clothes, right? I said, yeah, that's what we would do. So we have a number of problems that happen within congregations where fellowship is breached in a number of regards. Sometimes it's works of the church. Sometimes it's doctrines that are taught or believed and so forth. Here in this congregation, in context, it's over the makeup of Jesus' body, whether it was spiritual, whether it was physical, and so forth. The test of knowing that he gives here, the test of knowing God and of unity, again, based on the spirit of truth, which is the inspired scriptures. And I guess if you'd break it down even further, no obedience, and this is really where you guys were already headed. This is No obedience means not knowing God. You really can't get a whole lot simpler than that. That's what he's pretty much saying. Now notice there is such thing as absolute truth and absolute error, and the standard is always the scriptures. Now, that's not a very popular statement in today's society. <clears throat> most people today, and it's taught in most of our schools and universities, that there is no such thing as absolute truth, right? If you're against, if you're against murdering babies, then don't do it. It's wrong for you, but for another person, it may be okay. Well, no, it's, it's not okay ever. Uh, I saw the day where somebody said, men should not be making decisions for women's bodies. Uh, I don't know how it's... I wouldn't think that anybody's making a, uh, a decision for a woman's body. It's the baby that's inside, right? That's what we care about. Uh, but when they make a statement like that, what they're saying is, is there's no absolute truth. You don't have the right to tell somebody what they should or should not do. And that's a pretty common belief in our society today. The word knoweth, he that knoweth God, heareth us. I should have put both knoweth and heareth. Knoweth God, the ETH shows continuous action. Same thing with the ETH on heareth, right? If you're going to know him or to continue to know him, you have to continue to hear him. There is no such thing as I obeyed the gospel uh, and now I'm good to go, all right? Or that idea of well, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm a church of Christer, all right? Which drives me nuts when I hear people use that phrase. <clears throat> 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. All right. How loving do you think this congregation is right now in the middle of this dispute on whether Jesus had a physical body or a spiritual body? I don't know how, uh, how peaceful their conversations were within the congregation, uh, or how heated they were. But my guess would be that there were those that had strife going on because of the dispute of whether Jesus actually had a physical body or whether it was a spiritual body. Uh, how many of you guys have ever had a heated conversation with somebody over something religious? I have. Um, I've had conversations with people where it was starting to get very heated and they were raising their voice and I'm trying not to raise my voice because 
Guys, it's just, it's natural when somebody starts to raise their voice, what does somebody else normally do? You start to raise your voice. And I have found myself uh, in a couple of situations where they were getting angry. Usually I think they were getting angry is because they would say something and then I would give a verse and they would get angry and so voices start raising. Uh, the last few times it's happened, I've been able to stay calm. But I have to admit, I could feel my blood pressure rising because I was getting aggravated. Uh, because I'm giving verses and they're saying, I don't agree with that. You don't think that was happening within, within those congregations? Go ahead, Larry. The less you get aggravated when you're ever to give, whenever you can give book, chapter, and verse, the, I think what's aggravating to me is, is, for example, when someone says, well, you're saved by faith only, and then I would say, well, the Bible teaches you have to repent, and I give them the passage, let's say Luke 13, 3 or 5, uh, how can you still believe that you're saved by faith only when the Bible teaches you have to repent? And then they say, well, it's, we're saved by faith only. That's what aggravates me. Is when they hear a passage, they won't acknowledge it, right? That's just, it is aggravating to me. Although, go ahead, Wendy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, it's, it's going to crumble and fall. The foundation's not going to support it, and the whole thing's going to go to nothing. It, it, it does aggravate me, but at the same point, I don't get, I mean, I don't get mad. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys came from outside of, grew up outside the church, but Jerry, you have to admit probably the first few times you heard things that you'd never heard before. To be honest, your first response normally is to be somewhat defensive. Mine was. Sam will tell you when we were dating, she'd say, why do you do that? And I'd say, I don't know why we do that. Uh, I do not know. I still to this day do not know why during communion, I'm getting old, guys. <laughs> well, during communion in the Catholic Church, my father always three times stopped prayer three times. And I said, why do you do that? We've always done that. Well, I'm sure we have. My question is, why do you do that? I don't even know that he knows why he did that, right? That's what you do when you're raised as an altar boy and go to Catholic school, and that's what you're taught, right? And she would say, why do you do that? I don't know why we do that. Why do you believe that? I don't know why we believe that. That's just what we do. So does it surprise you when you talk to people who's, who say they, they're saved by faith only? You give them passages, and then they, and they can't answer you, and they, they just disregard what you say. It doesn't surprise me. It's aggravating to me. I mean, it, it, it literally is aggravating to me, but I get it. I get it, and that, <clears throat> to be honest, I really feel bad for a number of people who, who have been taught wrong, but that doesn't take away personal responsibility, does it? I mean, Jerry could have been taught wrong and just said, it's no big deal, but if you take... Yeah, you're... Yeah. Yeah, it's. Oh yeah, I know. Racism, prejudice. Yeah. But I think, probably, and, and I, I think every one of us probably would admit that some, somewhere within us, in some regard, we have biases. I'm sure we all do. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and some of us, luckily, where I was grown, where I grew up, there was a lot of racism. However, my, I wasn't raised that way because my dad wasn't racist. Most of his friends were of different backgrounds. But most of my friends and a lot of my family, they were very racist. So wouldn't surprise me when people are raised racist, as racists or prejudiced or biased that they wouldn't be biased towards religious teachings that they've been taught, like I was raised incorrectly, right? So you begin to think, I mean, they had the same problems. They had all the same problems. Um, the church really hasn't changed much, has it? I, it's really depressing, unfortunately, when we look. I mean, here he's dealing with a problem within a congregation over... 
what kind of body Jesus had. Uh, I wish we actually had more information about what really happened to the, to the congregation. We don't get all that information. But he, he then takes it to this talking about love. Why? Love's the foundation of all the commandments. If you think about it, uh, it was imperative that each Christian should realize the essentialness of love. Love is essential for us to be faithful Christians. First, we have to love God enough to be obedient to His teachings, right? And, you, and He's going to go on, He's going to actually get there in a second. We, we may not move fast enough to get there, but He's going to start talking about what God did for us in the giving of His Son. The fact that He did shows His love for us, which in turn should make us love Him. And if in turn we love Him because He sent His Son, what would we choose to do? Be faithful, right? And not just be faithful to God and love God, but love our brethren. Love is of God. It finds its origins in Him and proceeds from Him. And anybody who loves God must, must, as a consequence, love his brother. All right, let me touch on another area of, I wasn't, these are things I've just seen, so I'm just going to mention it. <clears throat> uh, I have seen, both in the north and in the south, the complete opposite of this, loving your brother, and I've seen it based on race. I hear people say, well, we don't have quite as much racism down south. I specifically know of a congregation where we took uh, non-Christians, we taught them, they were baptized, and the members of the congreg some members of the congregation told them they would help them find a congregation more suited to their background. What were they saying? We're white, you're not, we'll find a different congregation for you. Does that sound like people who love their brethren? No. And I've seen it in other congregations, not down south, but up north. Uh, I don't really want to say too much. So I actually met a, a lady from a congregation without going into too much detail and said, hey, how come you don't attend this congregation here? And she said, well, I don't go there because they're, they're racist there. And I said, those brethren aren't racist. I know those brethren. And guess what? They were. They're racist. I found out she wasn't, she wasn't lying. She was telling the truth. They were racist. Uh, my wife knows exactly where I'm talking about. It's, you don't, sometimes you don't notice what's right in front of your face. They didn't love their brethren. Uh, congregations like that are not going to grow. Oh, yeah. I'm raised up down there. Yeah. So I was, I saw on Facebook today, this argument has been going on for weeks now. Maybe some of you other brethren have seen this. Has anybody seen the argument going on about what you wear to church? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I normally on Wednesdays, I normally wear whatever I wore to work is what I wear here, right? I go home, uh, I scarf down whatever, I work on Bible study a little bit because I normally work on it at lunch also. I work on a little bit of Bible study. Uh, I don't, I, I might try to get a 20 minute nap in if I can. Uh, and, and I get up and I come here, right? This is what I wear. Uh, Sundays, I normally wear a suit. I do that for a number of reasons. However, this argument has been going on for weeks now about how people should dress. Let me just point one thing out. My best may be totally different than Jerry's best or Larry's best. And for anybody who really wants to know, my best suit at home I spent $10 on at Goodwill. There's probably people wearing jeans and a t-shirt or a nice shirt that spent a whole lot more money on their jeans and their shirt than I spent on my suit that I got at Goodwill for 10 bucks. Actually, it was $11, the last one, for the three-piece suit. Right? 
Yeah, it did. It had a $5 bill in the pocket. <laughs> Nothing like buying an $11 suit at Goodwill and getting a $5 bill in the pocket. But it, so here's my other point. But nobody's talking about modesty in general, even outside of worship. Shouldn't the whole idea of what's being discussed be modesty in general, which would also apply to the church building, but it has nothing to do with whether I'm wearing a suit or whether I'm wearing pants or a, and a button-up. But the whole conversation is about what do people wear to church. I don't know. What do people wear outside the church? Wouldn't that be just as important to discuss also? And how about the different income levels? Right? It used to be back in the old days, a guy had two bib overalls, right? The one that he worked in and the one that he wore to church. When did this become a primary focus within the church? And what type of image does it give? I've actually heard of people who've been turned away. A, a minister actually came and said, at the congregation I've preached at, I saw people turned away or told, if you don't wear this suit coat, you can't come in here. Well, I, I wouldn't either. Mm -hmm. That's how we prepare to worship. It's going to take some time to do that, right? And uh, if you're, I think a majority of the mainstream congregation, they're just showing up sitting in the seat, and there's no preparation. Mm -hmm. You've got to set aside lay it in store, right? What you're going to give. I think what we wear, we have to think about what we're wearing. Does it fit within the guidelines that the Bible teaches us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a guy in Memphis. Uh, I didn't see him personally. Uh, one of my instructors was there, and he gave us his name and what congregation he was at. But he showed up. The minister came down the aisle with an entourage behind him. wearing He was wearing a purple suit with a purple cape, white gloves, with a, with a walking stick. And there was a whole entourage as he came in. It's like, is, are we here for worship? Or is it just all about you? Same thing if you're dressing flashy, right? Uh, the, what we're talking about is modesty. No, it's not. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Well, it also depends on where you're at. If the majority of the congregation is wearing nice attire, you're not supposed to stick out, mm -mm. right? So if you're wearing holy jeans, holy t-shirt, when you have the other things to blend in and to not stick out, then you're making them skeptical of yourself. Yes. So the opposite way, if they don't dress really fancy and you're wearing a bright red suit with sequins all over it, well, you're going to stand out. And I know... And yourself showy then. Yeah, I know ministers that... Uh, farm congregations, let's say con country congregations, who uh, do not wear expensive suits or anything like that because they feel like they stand out as opposed to... Now, some wouldn't care. That wouldn't matter to me because I don't care if someone's wearing a suit or not. But I've had some say intentionally they used to always wear suits. They've now backed it off a little bit because they feel uncomfortable, like they're making them feel like maybe they're not dressed enough. I don't know that that would bother me. But I do recall the very first time I went to the Lord's Church, uh, I, did not have, I didn't have on dirty, nasty clothes, but I wasn't dressed as nice as the rest of the people in there. And we went out and I got dress clothes. Well, right? to add to that, though, is if, if you didn't have anything like that, there's no reason that you can't go, right? Mm -hmm. You need to go. And nobody said a word to me. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Be more dressed, most likely. Yeah. And in a congregation like this, we have more working type people, right? So they dress appropriately, you know. But again, it goes to the preparation. But we have different uh, wages in this congregation or any congregation, so everybody's going to be different. But it's, it's what you're preparing yourself for. I feel as comfortable in a pair of jeans and a button up. That I, that I would normally wear to work as I do in a suit. It, and it, well, whatever people wear doesn't even, doesn't even, I don't even notice that stuff. I can remember way back, I was pretty, pretty small, and I heard somebody in the church, and they were sitting right in front of my mom, I used to wear a slash. Oh, yeah. Church. When did they get over 
that some of them have not. Some of them have not. My, my wife has been told before that she's not to be wearing slacks at church. <laughs> she wouldn't listen to me either, Larry. I know. I don't. <laughs> Yeah. That's still being. It's still being taught in a lot of our brotherhood schools too. Wives are being told it is not acceptable at all for you to wear pants. Where did they get that? Tradition. I don't. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll grab you. The, the discussion that was in there is, you know, if you're preparing yourself for an interview, right, how are you dressing? If you're preparing yourself to meet the king or whatever, or the governor or whatever, and if you're going to wear, you're going to, you're going to prepare yourself for mm -hmm. that, right? But whether it's slacks or a dress wouldn't matter during an interview for me, right? If I saw some late lady come in. I think it's the, I don't think it's, for me, it's not the concern over preparation. I think it's the very ambiguous idea of whether or not someone is dressed appropriately or not. All we have is, in the Bible, is what? A description of modesty. We don't have a description of what the person has to wear, just that it's modest, right? Which goes back to the argument you brought up. Well, is she wearing pants or is she wearing a dress? Uh, is he wearing a button-up or is he wearing a suit? A lot of that stuff's very ambiguous. Uh, and again, it would go down to, like, like Jerry said, congregations. Some congregations are wealthier than others. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Well, our culture's idea of modesty keeps changing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we have to go back to the Bible. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell us what kind of material we have to be wearing. You know, if it's open for women or it's seamed in the center. What would people say if I showed up wearing exactly the same type of clothing Jesus wore in the first century and preached in that? Do you think there would be an uproar? Would there be an uproar if I wore that up here and I had my Nazarene knockabouts on, my sandals, and had an outfit like that on? I'd feel out of place, I'll tell you that, but... I mean, I'd go with it, but I'm just saying, it, I would... It, it, that wouldn't really, to be honest, it wouldn't be modest. I'd be drawing attention to myself. I'm trying to think of where it's at, but isn't it an example of the norm, the people that were dressed nice, and the one that came forward and that wasn't, was the abnormal one, I'm not mistaken. And how would you treat that person that wasn't dressed nice? Well, James talks about, would you bring, the, bring the, the one who's dressed in goodly apparel and say, sit here, and take the one in the bad apparel and say, sit there at my footstool. He gives a great example of that. Would you make a distinction between the two based on that outward appearance? We're not supposed to. I actually had this conversation not long ago, too, about why we within the churches of Christ do not use worldly titles and why we don't make distinctions between brothers and sisters in Christ because it's, it's not acceptable in any regard, whether it's race, whether it's whatever it is, uh, which really don't get me going on that. I, Sam was watching a TV show the other day. I don't know what she was watching. The first lady sh they were talking to. When did that start coming into the Churches of Christ? I saw that on a Facebook page the other day. And it wasn't up at Benton Harbor if they're watching this. It was, it was over in Detroit by memory, but it was a gentleman who uh, was referring to his wife as the first lady. When did, that when did that become commonplace within the Churches of Christ? You're elevating not only him, but his wife. Both of, the, both of those are wrong. I don't know how we veer off. We do it all the time. But 
In all those examples, we're talking about loving our brethren. We have so many examples of not loving our brethren. Oh, I remember how we got there. We got to, we got to the topic of, because people have been talking about clothing. Uh, there were a number of ministers and other people who said, I have seen people literally run off from the church uh, because they weren't dressed according to, and we've seen it. We have seen people who have been turned away or bad-mouthed, uh, and sometimes to their face, because of their clothing. Guys, if that's all you have, how's that going to make you feel? I mean, it, I, now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying also don't wear your, your junkiest T-shirt and whatever and come to church uh, without being prepared. I'm not saying that either. There's extremes, but that's been going, guys, that conversation's been going on for weeks now. Uh, I think it's gotten a little out of control. It's talking about loving our brethren. It's very possible that there were those in the early church, like today, despite the fact that they claimed to be Christians and they exhibited hatred for their brethren. Uh, we have examples of that, right? Diotrephes. We could start naming people in, the, in other congregations who were treating their brethren horribly, right? We can look at examples of that where it was taking place. We know for a fact there was problems within the church, some who were exalting themselves, some who were treating other Christians badly. Uh, you had a number of problems within different congregations, okay? Really, you've got hatred going, uh, taking place for, against their brethren. So in context, as we're looking at this, and he's talking about loving our brethren, this may have been occurring by the docetists. I got docetist Gnostics. The docetists were the early versions of the Gnostics or the knowing ones. Amid the disagreement over the physical versus the spiritual question regarding the body of Christ during his ministry. I can just hear them bickering back and forth. Well, he didn't, have a, he didn't have a physical body, right? He couldn't have had a physical body. Yeah, he did have a physical body. No, it was spiritual. Were they, were they getting, uh, exhibiting hatred for one another as they're sitting and disputing over this? My guess would be yes, but I don't get some of that information. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now this goes back to, just, just like we had a second ago where he talks about those who love God hear us. He gives another one here. He that does not love does not know God. So you can know those who know God because they're going to love their brethren, right? God is love. All right. The meaning is that one who claims to be a child of God but doesn't have or show the love which should exist between true children of God, demonstrates the very fact that he doesn't know God. He doesn't know God because he doesn't love those who are of the family of God. As a matter of fact, he's not acting like a child of God. He's acting like a child of the devil or the, a child of the world, right? He has a worldly attitude, and that's why he doesn't love his brethren. So he's not acting like a child of God. He's acting like a child of the world. So either he has never truly known God, or, here's the other option, he was genuinely converted and at one time faithful, but he's left the faith. Now you could go back and look at 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22, uh, like a dog returning to his vomit, or a sow uh, who's been cleansed wallowing in the mire, right? Those are really the two options if somebody doesn't love their brethren. Either they didn't truly know God in the first place, uh, or they were genuinely converted, but they've, they've left the faith, or they're at least not, they're not being faithful to uh, the requirements of the faith, and that is to love our brethren. We do that. Go ahead, Larry. It does. So I, this isn't in my notes, but go ahead with what you're thinking. You'll hear people say, well, you know, you must, you must not really love me if, you know, when you try to correct somebody or uh, you're not showing the love of Christ when you, when you treat me so in a certain way. Well, we can't be enablers in certain regards either. Uh, it's, not, it's not unloving to tell someone that they're in a sinful state or it's not unloving to tell them that they're not an actual Christian because they have not obeyed the gospel. There's a lot of things we might tell somebody or discuss with somebody that they, they think is unloving, uh, but it's not unloving. Uh, I had a discussion today with a gentleman who, uh, 
due to a medical issue he just found out he had, decided he was going to quit drinking. Uh, and I was talking with him a little bit, of, and, and he was going to quit. Basically, he said, you know, I'm, I'm not healthy, I'm going to quit. And so we were discussing how I told him I have a brother who is a, had a serious problem with alcohol. And I said, you know, you could tell the guy as many times as you want that he shouldn't drink, and we all know that we shouldn't, not that people don't make mistakes and do things. Uh, sometimes you tell people what's good for them and what they should not be doing, and they, they think you're being unloving to them, right? That's not saying that we're not loving our brethren. Um, it's an un, that's, a, that's an unbased accusation to say, well, you don't love me because of the way you're treating me. Sometimes we have to be very blunt with people or explain things in a certain way. That's not what he's talking about here. In context, there may have been a serious lack of love being shown between the docetists and the faithful Christians within the congregation. And again, I wish we had a whole lot more information about just how, how heated or how hot this discussion was within the congregation. It's, it's a big enough deal. John's writing to them about it. Big enough that he's, he's addressing a letter to them about it. So... Again, I don't know how big this was. My guess is it was probably a pretty big issue. Uh, it, you know, if we, had a, if we had an issue big enough, there's no apostles running around, even though the congregation down the road says they got one. If we had, a, if we had an issue so big that an apostle actually heard about it and took time to write a letter, I'd say that's probably a pretty big issue, wouldn't you? So my guess is this was a, a pretty heated issue. Notice the determining factor here. For love, the determining factor of love would easily determine, and this goes back to the previous test he gave, who was guilty of not behaving as a true child of God. And this could possibly be true on both sides. You could have a Christian who biblically believes correct. Let's say you have, you have a guy over here who says, Jesus had an actual physical body, and Jesus actually shed his blood on the cross. You've got to go over here that says, Jesus didn't have a physical body, he didn't actually hang on the cross and shed his blood. And both of those guys could be treating each other as horribly as they could be treating one another, and both of them could be guilty of not loving their brethren. Both of them could have unloving uh, attitudes. While one is scripturally correct and the other one is scripturally incorrect, they could both be guilty of the way that they're treating one another. So it's not, it's not enough to just say, well, I'm biblically correct. Okay, well, you could be biblically correct, but you're, you could still be extremely unloving in the way that you're dealing with that person. I'm not saying you're not, wrong, you're not right or wrong. I'm saying the way that you're approaching it is wrong, right? I mentioned today there was a guy who was very upset and <clears throat> apparently raised his voice a little bit. I didn't hear the conversation. He may have been right on the money. He may have had a valid reason for raising his voice. Does that give him a, the right to, to talk to somebody in that manner? No. Not any more than it would give me the right to be rude or mean or whatever, hateful to somebody just because I'm biblically correct. Uh, how many of you guys have ever seen, there's a certain person I defriended. I'm not going to say his name. You guys would all know his name. I did not go to school with him. He is a prominent minister within the Churches of Christ. Uh, and he does a lot of debating on Facebook. And he's right on a lot of stuff. He's wrong on stuff too. The reason I no longer will follow anything he says or listen to him or even have anything to do with him is he is the most... He is the meanest minister. He's, he is the meanest person I literally think I have seen probably on Facebook. Uh, and he is very hateful, specifically also to women in general. But he's the meanest person I've ever seen on Facebook who associates and actually preaches for a church somewhere. He will call people stupid. He will call them, I mean, ignorant is an actual correct word. There is, you could say someone is ignorant. He will call them stupid. He will call them names. Sam probably has a fairly good idea who I'm talking about. If not, if you don't want to admit it, don't. But the guy's horrible. Horrible. Uh, and he is one of, the, one of the most prominent names I'm aware of as far as... And he's usually right on the majority of stuff. There's a few things he's way off on. But how do you think that comes across to outsiders, people outside the church? I know it comes across bad because I'm actually a member of the Lord's church, the same as him, and I look at it and go, I don't even want to see anything you say anymore. It's, it's that bad. It's that off-putting. Like, I can't even stand to look at it. It's embarrassing. I'd let him call me stupid. Would it help? I've had people call me worse. 
I've had people call me worse, and a few times they were right. <laughs> but, what, I mean, what does it matter? What does it matter? Right, I mean, I, I, again, I'll, I'll be very careful. So where I currently work, I have, I have had a few times, my wife actually knows I came home, I've had a few times where I was treated really bad by a, one or two employees in particular, and I really like these people. Uh, and at no point did I get angry or and both and all the times that it happened, they came back to me the next day and guess what they did? They apologized. What do you think you want to take them over the fact that they don't help each other that way? They already knew they did wrong. What, what? I'm talking about the guy if you were calling the suit. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, la the two times that it really happened, which it was kind of kind of hurtful, they got really angry. I could have got mad or I could have said something, and I didn't. And, you know, to be honest, if I had, I wonder if they would have came back the next day and apologized. If I treated them the same way that they treated me, I wonder if it would have made a difference in whether or not they went back and felt bad. Like, they literally came and said, I felt so bad after I did that. Probably not the response I would have got if I would have treated them back the same way they treated me. Well, the guy that today that was yelling, uh, there's a few times he's been extremely angry on the floor when I was there, and I was just able to talk to him. He, he calmed down. So I've never had him yell at me. He was angry. Uh, I like the guy. So if he's watching this, I doubt he is. I really like the guy, actually. He's a, he's a loud talker, and he can get mad, but who here hasn't? I actually like the guy a lot. Uh, so I went and actually asked. He, we didn't lose an employee today. And said, no, he's, he's just not going to be here for a little while. <laughs> uh, and, and here's the thing. The guy that gave him a suspension, he said, I like him a lot, too. I really like that guy. He's not in a good place, I think. How many of you guys have ever been there? That's actually what I said to... Yeah. I have worked in plants where it was, it was not uncommon at all and nothing would be said to somebody who screamed and yelled at you. This is a facility that doesn't allow that, but in a lot of places I've worked, that is not uncommon. And that's actually what... And that's, that's what my boss actually said. He's like, somebody could scream and yell at me and you, and he named another guy. And he's like, that wouldn't bother any of us. We could take that. But here you've got a lady who's crying because of the way he's talking. But I, I like the guy, and, and, you know, he's just, he can't be in a good place. Otherwise, he wouldn't act that way. And I think we've all been there. But I'm not suggesting that's a rule for a Christian. No, 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 no. I would love... I, would, I really wish we had more background into just how bad this was, but my guess is this is pretty bad, being that John is addressing this in a let. Are we already out of time? <laughs> Guys, we need to make Bible class two hours long. Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? You don't need to raise your voice. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who didn't hear that on the internet, Jerry just said you don't need to raise your voice. <laughs> so... Just so you guys get it, I told Sam, I said, hey, anything exciting going on? She said, no. How about you? I said, I'm just listening to a guy yell. And she said, what about? And I wrote back in all capital letters, some people are just loud. So basically it came across as screaming. Some people are just like that, right? Uh, both sides here would have been claiming to have been correct concerning the faith. However, belief plus actions equal confirmation. All right, let me read this verse and we're going to quit. In this... Was manifest, it was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. All right, this is a really good passage we're getting into now. He's now going to talk about... So we, we're to love God and we're to love our brethren. But if you really want to truly understand what love is and why it is you should love God, He was willing to send His Son, His only begotten Son, into the world that we could live through Him. You really want to start to get to understand love, why you should love God and why you should love your brethren? Well, let's go back to the prime example. The greatest love, probably, the greatest love certainly that was ever shown, and that was in the sending of a Redeemer. So that's where we're going to pick up, 1 John 4, 9. Uh, we should have a pretty good conversation about that. And I will hand this over, I assume, with Brother Joe.